Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here or you haven't done so already, please remember, if you enjoy what you're hearing, hit that subscribe button and also tickle the bell, set it to all. That way you'll always know every time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. If you would like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes or you would like to buy me a coffee, all the information can be found down below in the description. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Also, there might be strong language throughout. Listener discretion is highly advised. On a trip back to the islands for my grandmother's funeral, a pregnant cousin of mine, my older brother and sister, and I decided to try to talk to our recently passed grandfather. Now, everyone back in the islands are very superstitious, so there are no Ouija boards available there. So, we had to make one out of cardboard and a magnifying glass. We waited until night after the funeral and head down to the beach behind our grandfather's house and started summoning the spirits. All of us never really believed in the spirits, so we started off just fucking around and asking if Elvis or Michael Jackson could speak to us. But then we did finally ask for my grandpa. Everything started feeling eerie as fuck. The magnifying glass started to move, and it moved to the letter S before my grandma came running down the hill yelling at us. What have you done? What have you done? and started hitting us. None of us really thought anything of it until the next night. My cousin had a miscarriage. I'm not sure if it was a coincidence or not, but I don't fuck around with Ouija boards anymore. I used Session. Quite a strong aversion to Ouija boards, which started I don't know when and ended up some time around the age of 16 and 17 when I used one for the very first time in my life. Fast forward another one to two years and my cousin and I been using the board probably nearly every weekend, at least one, if not both nights, since that first time. It has become one of my favorite pastimes. Sometimes we'd have other friends join us, but it was always at least us. We took it very seriously, were as careful as we needed to be, and always had good results and nothing bad ever came out of it. Well, outside of our first experience, but that's another story. Other than that one time, however, we had plenty of both cool and or creepy encounters, but two stand out above all others. Once I wouldn't call a positive experience because of the insinuated nature of the speaker who came through, but neither was the experience itself inherently negative. The other time I wouldn't call a negative experience, again, just because of the nature of the speaker who came through but neither was the experience itself inherently positive. We haven't used a Ouija board since, and we have kids now, so we probably never will. To this day, nearly half of my lifetime later, I still don't know what to make of, of either experience. In the first of these two incidents, we spoke at length with a being that would not give us its name, but much to our amusement told us to simply call it Chewy. Yeah, really. You read that correctly, and it's true. This Chewy went on to share some highly questionable and objectionable things, but we weren't put off because we had come to suspect we weren't talking to our usual 
sort of speaker, and we wanted to get answers. When we asked what we were talking to, the board spelled out D-A-M-O, and then it stopped. We all looked at each other knowing full well, as you do now, what Chewy was spelling out. We closed the line and ended the session as we always took care to do so. If not, a little more eagerly than usual. Sometime later, days, weeks, months, I cannot remember. We were at it again. This time we spoke with the being who was a half-proclaimed angel, earthbound for reasons that were never really fully explained or which have been partly forgotten which included being my guardian angel. They named themselves Sek, which at the time meant next to nothing to me. Noted. Therefore, we couldn't seem to get anyone else on the board. Eventually, some time between sessions, the board warped. We got out of the practice of using it, and I never saw the board in Oracle or Planchette in the same place again. Much more recently, the thought of this came to mind out of the blue, and I tried looking it up to see if it was a thing, but the only thing I could find was Sekhmet, the Egyptian goddess. I have no formal knowledge of demons, angels, or deities, especially in a magical sense, or on a personal level. Plenty of people claim to have contacted demons who specifically named themselves, but what are people's experiences with angels and or deities? I collect Ouija boards. I know how strange this sounds. Most people collect stamps, coins, vinyl, posters, and the like. I should probably preface this by saying... I have pretty extensive knowledge of the paranormal. I have been having experiences with it since I was a child. This led me to delve into the world of paranormal investigation in my teens and early 20s, which concluded with my beginning to collect the boards. Since then, I have amassed quite a collection, but there is one that I refuse to keep in my house. I call it the Salem board. I used to do FX makeup for films, and I was in Salem, Massachusetts for a job. As we have probably gathered, I am a lover of the strange, unusual, and all things creepy. So, I was thrilled by this opportunity. I had gotten into town a few days before filming began, so I could prep, but also so I could do a little sightseeing. I was wandering through some of the shops and happened to walk into one that had a pretty large collection of Ouija boards. Some were vintage, some were etched glass, and some were burnt wood. At the back of the shop, there was a locked display case, which immediately caught my eye. Alone on the top shelf was a board that looked as though it was the cross section of a tree stump. It had the unusual markings of a Ouija board, but they looked to be hand-carved into the board. It was also covered with runes. I went to the guy behind the counter and asked him how much it was. It's not for sale, he said quietly. Why not? I asked. He looked back at the cabinet and then back at me. That board is made from a tree that was used to hang witches during the Salem Witch Trials. I looked at him skeptically. That was a pretty tall claim. I really did want the board, though. It would look great in my collection and be a cool conversation piece. Are you sure you don't want to sell it? Once again, he looked between me and the cabinet. $150. Cash. No returns. I handed him the money, and he walked to the cabinet to unlock it. He must have noticed the confused look on my face when he handed me the board. Here. It doesn't come with a planchette. The board was not exactly meant to be used. 
I wasn't exactly sure how to respond to that, so I just said thanks and left the shop. Fast forward a few months. I am back home in Seattle in my one-bedroom apartment where I lived alone. I had put the Salem board in a box in my closet since I was waiting on a new display case and didn't really have anywhere else to put it. My closet had two sliding doors and a shelf on top of a bar where you would, you know, hang your clothes. The shelf was actually pretty large, so it accommodated the box with room to spare. I'd gone to bed that night and fell asleep with the TV on. I was awoken at around 3 a.m. by the sound of something hitting the closet door. I checked to make sure my ball python, Kronos, was in his cage, since every time he got out, he would try and get into my closet where the hot water heater was. I saw he was curled up under his log and cautiously opened the closet door to see the box had fallen off the shelf and was now resting against the door. I was puzzled at this because I thought in my sleepless state that I had just not pushed it back far enough. I pushed the box back and went back to sleep. Another 30 minutes later, I heard another noise from my closet, but this time it was much louder. When I opened my eyes, I could see that one of my closet doors had been pushed outwards. The box had fallen off the shelf again, but this time had done it with so much force it had wedged between the clothes and the door. At this point, I was becoming a bit concerned. Instead of putting the box back on the shelf, I placed it on the floor of my closet and shut the door. When I woke up in the morning, I turned over to grab my phone off the nightstand and saw the closet door wide open. The box had been pushed out into the middle of my room. At this point, I became concerned. This was an object with a lot of emotion attached to it. A lot of anger and a lot of pain and suffering. I thought it best to keep it in a box and put my box in my storage unit. A few years go by and my mom keeps bugging me to clean out some things from the unit since she needed some space for her stuff. It was in the middle of summer and the storage unit was sweltering hot. I was going through some boxes and aimlessly tossing things into the piles when I came upon the box. The room was suddenly freezing. I took the lid off and I looked down. The Salem board was sitting on top of several other Ouija boards I had acquired over the years. They all had been cracked in half right down the middle. All of them, except the Salem board. I stared into the box trying to comprehend what I was looking at. These boards looked like someone had broken them in half over their knee. Surely not the result of a box being dropped or jostled. I removed the board from the box and placed it on a wooden chest I had acquired from my great-grandmother, who had considered herself to be a witch. It remains in that box to this day. I believe there are forces in this world that we will never understand. I am sure you are wondering why I didn't get rid of the board. Well, in a way, I felt tied to it. It called to me and I answered. I consider myself its keeper. As long as it is with me, everyone else is safe from whoever or whatever is attached to it. Warning. I'm religious, so I might have some bias or superstition or skepticism in here. I apologize in advance. So, this will be my first time telling this story and I'm deciding to share it with you. It's not really scary, but I've had my moments. So, anyway, a few years ago, my freshman year of college, I got in with a friend group that was really into doing the Ouija board for fun. We'd have nights where we'd be in the basement of the dorm, snacks and blankets all around us in the study room, just summoning ghosts for shits and giggles. Now, it doesn't exactly help with the fact that the town our school is in is nicknamed 
Second Salem because there were rumored witchcraft practicing like a hundred years ago. If that's true, nobody really knows, but that doesn't stop urban legends about a haunted water tower near campus popping up or an actual club or on campus being a paranormal investigation team. I digress. So, the first time I went on the board, I was given rules that I don't entirely know if they're true or not. Mainly that you have to move the planchette in a clockwise motion a few times and then stop. Like, opening a gate, I think? I don't know, but it seemed to work. Long story short, my first time on the board, I met a protection spirit I'd had for several years but didn't know. His name was Adam. He gave a description of himself and stuff, and he was the first one on the board for every session I was on. I should also note, we never played alone. Later sessions would lead to people meeting family members. I'm still skeptical on whether or not that was real. I'm still shaken up by some family members' deaths and wanting nothing more than to talk to them again. I got to talk to someone claiming to be this family member and, for the record, asking them questions only they would know garnered the correct responses. A good part of me is skeptical on this. However, because this could be just wishful thinking or something sinister in disguise. Speaking of sinister, holy shit. We got a lot of demons. I almost got possessed twice. The first time everyone went to go get food and I decided to stay and watch our stuff. While I was alone, despite being by the heater, it was ice cold. And I also felt tired and like I couldn't get up from my chair. We asked the board when everyone came back as I apparently looked super tired and the spirit on the board said, I was almost possessed, and we should stop for the night. We had some real idiots in the group who pressed onward. I eventually left, putting some salt I had under my door just in case. The second time, I watched a possession of some kind. I was on the board, and a demon. We had two main ones, Nim Nim or M.M. Thankfully, never the Z one was taunting us. We noticed my one friend was super quiet and we looked over to see her rocking back and forth and staring at the ceiling, unresponsive. We quickly said goodbye to the board and shook her out of it. She was fine and had no idea what was happening. We got on again after taking a break and I suddenly began to feel like I was seeing out of someone else's eyes, if that makes sense. I felt dizzy and like my body wasn't in my control. I stepped out of the trance, somehow, and my friend said I wasn't responding for a good four to five minutes. We didn't play that board for at least two weeks after that. We were too shaken up to. My final fear story is a two-parter. Part one, I was on the board with a friend and suddenly started getting dizzy. I saw a figure in front of me that was a little girl with like a black veil on. One of her eyes was like infected, but it was all black with like cracks across her face. She looked fucking terrifying and for some reason I couldn't bring myself to look her dead in the face. I snapped out of it thanks to my friends shaking me and said I wanted to stop for the night. Part 2 Later at night, a friend of mine saw the exact same figure watching him as he slept. Same creepy little girl, same freakish face. 100% sure it was a demon of some kind. There are my little anecdotes. I haven't played with the board in maybe a year. Uh, I'm interested in hearing people's inputs on my experiences. It's some of the most scariest things I've ever had to deal with. Oh, uh, before I forget, there was something about the demon attaching to us or others with poor mental health. I supposedly had at least one with me and had migraines, increased depressive thoughts, 
and like a clawing feeling on my shoulder. I couldn't see any marks or anything, so I probably just had a shoulder ache. I'd love to hear any feedback or input. I'm sure this is pretty vanilla, but it's not like I can go share this with just anyone. This is a long story, but it is 100% true. In the summer of 2019, I was 19 at that time, I had a lot of shit happen that caused me to become very depressed. My boyfriend had just broken up with me without telling me why, and shortly after, I was assaulted by my so-called friend. Needless to say, I was at a point in my life where I didn't give a shit about anything. So, when my friend asked if I wanted to use a Ouija board with her, I of course said, Hmm, hell yeah. We agreed to go to our local Books A Million to buy the board and decided we would split the cost since it was only 20 bucks. My friend, we'll call her Lily, instantly started having doubts about whether she would mess with that kind of stuff. Both of us are Christians and are always taught that messing with that stuff was a big no-no. However, I assured her that all would be well and that if it would make her more comfortable, we would buy some protecting incense to burn around the house while we played. This made her feel better and we proceeded to purchase the board. The main reason Lily wanted to use the board was because her grandmother had just passed away and she wanted to see if she could contact her. I did warn her that if her grandmother was in heaven, she most likely wouldn't come through since the Lord wouldn't allow this. I did support her and agreed to at least try to contact her. As for the motive, since I was a little kid, I had always felt something or someone wanting to talk to me. So, being the depressed girl that I was, I was just like, fuck it, bring it on, demons. I also had vivid dreams where, in every one of them, I was assaulted by demons and would end up being the mother of the Antichrist. I obviously didn't smile and still don't take these dreams seriously. But my friend was intrigued to see how anyone or anything would care to explain them to me. Fast forward to her grandmother's house. Lily's grandfather wasn't there because he was taking physical therapy for his hip. So, it was just us and the board. I could tell Lily was nervous, and a small part of myself was too. But I refused to show it. I was assigned to be the guide the person that asks questions and such. So, I placed myself in a comfortable position and opened the board. Are there any spirits that would like to speak with us today? Nothing. The planchette didn't move and everything was silent. I asked the same question about four or five times before there was movement. As soon as it moved to yes, I asked what their name was. It spelled out some sort of gibberish that I can't remember and ended up telling us it was one of my cousins that died in a fire. I knew that I didn't have any known cousins that had died in a fire, but I played along with it. At some point, the spirit began making a figure eight across the board, counting down numbers for which I said a stern, Hell no! before saying goodbye and moving to the next session. The same little girl kept contacting us repeatedly, except she didn't make figure eights or count down like she had before. Lily and I both tried to figure out what the hell this thing wanted. Before we knew it, this little girl changed into a male demon named Bobo. Based on my readings about the Ouija board, I knew that this could have been Zozo. However, he swore up and down that he wasn't, but Zozo was in the room with us. Apparently, Zozo wanted to harm us, but 
Bobo wanted to protect me, not Lily, just me, which I thought was weird as fuck. After talking with him some more, we learned that he was present in all of these dreams I had been having. He was destined to be the father of said Antichrist and claimed that he was and is deeply in love with me. Of course, I thought all of this was bullshit, but Lily was excited and began asking questions. Every time she would ask something, the planchette moved to know. Eventually, she gave up and asked if he just wanted to talk with me. I agreed and continued asking questions. Apparently, there was this whole plan in hell where I was going to be the mother of the Antichrist. Bobo was in very high ranks when it came to other demons. According to him, his rank was right below Lucifer's. All of a sudden, the planchette flew to goodbye and the board stopped all movement. Lily and I agreed to try one more time to contact her grandmother, but of course, it was Bobo again. He said he had revealed too much information and displeased Lucifer, but at the same time, Lucifer, or Satan, wanted me to know some of his knowledge. I'm still completely skeptical at this point, so I just shrugged and said, mm, whatever. All of a sudden, I could feel something brushing against my lips and cheeks. The feeling moved down to my breast and caused me to shiver. I yelled out, fuck this, and closed the session. Then both of us lit lavender incense and walked all around the house, saying the Lord's Prayer. After that, it was getting late, so we went inside and went to bed. I don't know what made me want to see the board by myself, but the next day, I thought it would be a good idea to do. Lily sat in front of me while I did it alone and watched as the planchette moved to spell the name Bovo. After talking for a solid two minutes, I got creeped out and stopped. Fast forward months later, I was at my friend Kate's house with my other friend Ashley. My father had burned the board once he knew I had used it, but we all wanted to use it again. So, we went to good old Books A Million again and purchased another board. Lo and behold, after we started using it, Vovo was the only one to come through. He yelled at both of my friends and told them he only wanted to talk to me. He claimed he had been watching me since I was five and that everything that was planned was supposed to go down in 2024. He also claimed that in order to get me pregnant, he was going to either, warning, rape me or possess my current boyfriend and do it that way. Nonetheless, this all creeped the hell out of my friends, and we stopped using it. You would think I would learn by this point, but a couple of months ago, I am 20 now, I went to my other friend's Amanda's house, and we got high with her and her friends. This was probably the stupidest thing I've done in my life, but Jay encouraged all of us to play while he was high. I don't remember any of it if I'm being honest. But according to Amanda, I was saying random shit, and they had contacted Bovo. Bovo refuses to let anyone talk and kept spelling my name. However, I was too gone to say or do anything. After an hour of my friends trying to get him to talk to them, he spelled my name the entire time. They gave up and helped me get to bed. Moral of the story, it seems that whenever I use the Ouija board, I talk to the same spirit or demon. You may wonder if I'm worried about this, to which I tell you, not at all. I'm still very strong in my faith and believe the Lord wouldn't allow that to happen. I guess we'll just have to wait and see in 2024. Hello everybody, 
The story is long and requires a lot of context, but be patient because it's worth it. I created this story to talk about some of the things I've been through in the last two years because, frankly, I'm starting to forget some older experiences from new ones piling on top. Chronologically, this is like my 8th or ninth paranormal supernatural experience, and it stands as one of the scariest. For the skeptical, I swear before God and all that is good that this is all true. This story takes place at a cabin in Vermont. What up, Vermont? One room, 16 by 16, lofted area for bed, wood stove for heat, no running water. Attachment with a compost toilet pretty far away, nestled into a mountainside on a dirt road off a dirt road, both formerly logging trails. My girlfriend found the place on Craigslist and wanted to move into it together because in lieu of rent, we could provide eight hours of labor a week to the landlord. I like adventure and wild settings. And I was nervous that if she went in without me, she would be in over her head. The backstory on the cabin is that it was built by a man, initials DC, in the mid-70s. DC suffered from schizophrenia and lived in the cabin while renting out another cabin on the property for income. Somewhere along the line, he had a couple in his rental property who couldn't make rent and wouldn't move out. And that upset him. While they were gone, he burned their home, which he owned, to the ground. In the fallout, their relationship ended and they drifted away. DC built another cabin, a shack really, two four by eight rooms with a seven foot ceiling, adjacent to the rubble and moved in. I assumed that was so he could rent out the larger cabin, but no one I spoke to about it could confirm that. Most of his history comes from the landlord, who briefly knew DC and a college friend of his who still lives in the mountain, in a shack made of plastic tarp and propane cooking stove for heat. He is a dear, dear humble man, and a beautiful artist who did not like talking to strangers, but he and I connected over our love of nature and our willingness to get aesthetic in the suit of freedom. The shack still stands on the property, but the roof is full of holes and is terribly rotten. It is frankly questionable how a structure as unsound as it is still standing, but it does. The shack overlooks the cabin and can be seen looking out from the bathroom window and the southwest window in the main cabin. It was unearthly to see the moonlight. The story takes place on November 18th, I checked my messages, of last year, roughly two weeks after my girlfriend and I, we'll just call her Kay, moved in. Kay had some problems and still does. I love her dearly, though. And at this point in time, we were inseparable. The day started normally. She went to work, I stayed at home, gave the dog a bath. A steady stopped by looking for her, second time she was out, and delivered a card. I texted her a photo and I tell her to get in touch without thinking and that set her off. I had to go to work so I sent her a message that said I trusted her and would see her later. I went to work with the landlord, a mean old piece of shit, off the bad yogi variety, and left my phone in my coat. We were buckling logs and splitting wood that day, which is warm work, as the old saying goes, so I tossed my coat on the side and didn't hear my phone ring. When we were done splitting wood, he needed my help to drop off a car of his for repair. He needed my help because he has no friends, and the place we were going was some random rustic shop because he thought he could make the guy work for extra cheap. On the way back, I finally took a look at my phone, and there's the one message you never, ever want to see. 
the suicide note. We got back to the mountain, and I'm at a loss. My car has been sitting since the day I brought it over because the battery is dead. It has no gas in it because I forgot my wallet the last time I drove it and her car. The reliable one is wherever she is, and she won't answer text messages. I tried calling her relatives, but no luck. So I mentioned the predicament to the landlord, and he cracks a joke that she's already dead, ha 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 ha, before covering up with a very hollow, it's usually nothing. He says I can have a half gallon of gas off a gas can, and he'll give me a jump, but that's it. I honestly didn't care because it was enough to get me moving and I was in no mood to be wasting my energy on his bullshit. So I set out. Jumper cables in the passenger seat, three bucks in my pocket for gas. Literally all I had at that point because you don't work for rent if you flush your money down the toilet. And I white knuckled it to town praying with my whole soul that she would be all right. I drove to all her usual spots with no luck and went to the bar where her sister works in hopes of finding her there. She wasn't working, so I gave the bartender my number and asked him to reach out to her, saying it was urgent. Then I went to Kay's work, babysitting, and asked how she was when she left. Her employer told me that she left bitterly swearing and she was going to kill herself, but she hadn't done anything because it didn't seem right. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. Then, a glimmer of hope. Her sister had heard from her. A single text message of the letter S. But, after roughly five hours up against it, we knew she was still breathing. You can't imagine my relief. So I went home and kept texting her encouragement. Night fell, and I was in the cabin, alone, waiting. I'm a little bit of a poet, so I finally sent this poem to her. Sweet baby girl, out on your own, who knows the way that will guide you back home? We love you, we miss you, our beating hearts have flown. Out from our chests to seek our missing one. She came home a half hour later staggered through the door and fell into my arms, sobbing. She said she had been stopped three times on her way back up to the mountain because she lacked the strength to return, but she said I had called her back. I asked her how she was, and she said she felt heavy and cold, like she had fallen down a dark hole. She said she couldn't find her way out and that she had lost the light. I specifically remember her saying she felt like something was trying to swallow her and wouldn't let her go. Then she looked at me and said she thought something from the cabin or the mountain was attacking her through her Ouija board. At this point, I fell thoroughly up against her. Her Ouija board is over 100 years old, one of the original boards made from a single piece of wood. I had seen it once or twice and didn't like it much because my background is the kind of Christianity that strongly believes in the existence of demons and spirits and the like. And depending on who you ask, a Ouija board is like a direct door into hell. Her board stored in a closet under the cabin, reachable only by a steep dirt path, tucked in any one of a random assortment of boxes. The last time Kay had been down there, she very nearly fell onto a pair of scissors, to put it bluntly. There were bad vibes, and they were strong. So I told her I will deal with it if she agreed to follow my orders until we were done. She was nearly dead on her feet and agreed. The first thing I did was climb up to the loft and get my crucifix. It was a gift for me from a man I met walking my dog passed down to him from his German grandmother, who had it blessed by a Catholic priest. I have another story about that crucifix, but that's for another day. 
I set her on the couch and hand her the crucifix with the order to hold it in front of her and do not do or say anything. My father is a pastor, my mother a devout, so I called them. I told my mother what the situation was and she said, you can't exercise a board because it's inherently evil. To which I replied, I know mom, but I can drive away anything coming through it and bind its power. I asked her to pray for my protection and success and she said she would. I cleared my desk so I had a place to put the board. When I got back, laid my Bible on it to be ready to hand, put on my coat and looked out of the front door. I did not want to go out. I cannot tell you how much I did not want to go out. The board made me uncomfortable on a good day. Now I have to go find it in a closet in the dark by myself with the full knowledge that it was trying to kill my girlfriend. I put on the only shitty headlamp we had, mustered my courage, and stepped out. It was dark. There was a light breeze, and the area just felt heavy. Imagine the feeling of resistance of walking in a heavy wind, but without the wind to justify the resistance. I shuffled down the embankment to the closet took a deep, deep breath and opened the door. The lamp only lit half the space and I did not enjoy that whatsoever. Fortunately for me, the box was in the first box I opened. We kept it wrapped in a purple alpaca wool shawl with moons and stars on it that I got from the man who gave me the crucifix. With the intention of keeping it both tucked away and relatively placated. The shawl was super soft and the board said it should be cleaned with a silk cloth before use. Unfortunately for me, the shawl was half unwrapped and the naked board was hanging out in the cold. I picked it up by the covered part and wrapped it up. I took one step and something happened. I say something because it felt like I stumbled, but I didn't. I was anticipating fuckery and didn't want to drop the board or any other such negative thing, so I was moving slowly and deliberately. But I put my foot down and had to brace myself to keep from falling over. The second step was the same. I really can't describe it because I didn't feel a hand or a shove and my feet didn't slip or slide, but my balance was all over. I carefully climbed up the embankment, went back in, and set the board in the spot I had made for it. I unwrapped the board and placed my Bible directly between me and it. I sat there, put my hands flat on the desk, and went for it. I cast out the evil, and I bound the board with the most powerful clear and distinct language I could imagine. Dealing with an evil spirit is like make a wish of a genie and you really don't want to leave loopholes. As soon as I had finished speaking, the heavy feeling that had been lingering vanished. I wrapped up the board and asked Kay if it worked. She smiled and nodded, closed her eyes and said that she could see the light again and the feeling of being trapped was gone. Now, there's one little wrinkle I want to leave with you, and I swear to you it is true. The night before all that happened, I had a dream. In that dream, I ran out into a pier to the ocean through fierce winds and crashing waves to get Kay, and I carried her back as strong storms howled and tried to throw us in the sea. When we made land and looked for shelter, I opened a door in a pillar and thrust her in ahead of me. Then I went in and found the room full of people in historical garb, some 1920s era something or another. I want to say they were 12 or 13, but it was a dream, so I can't be exact. I do remember clearly a little boy, newsy style, with thick blood coming down from under his cap and a very haunting look in his eye. 
I opened the door and I pulled us both out of the room and that's when I woke up. So I have always been somewhat of a believer in the paranormal and didn't buy into the whole thing of spirits and demons were common. That is, until I had some things happen to me as an adult. As a child, I experienced a few things that were also witnessed by my mother, so I knew that there are some truths to it all. About four years ago, I experienced something one night that has changed my entire life forever. At first, I was pretty excited over what had happened, but then like a flick of a switch, it all turned dark. And I mean very dark. I was investigating my own experience, doing everything I could or had seen on TV. Yeah, I know now that that was a huge mistake. But at the time, I was trying to get answers and was willing to do anything that I could to get them. Even something that I had always sworn I would never do. Attempting to use a spirit board. I was doing all of my investigating by myself. Another mistake. And I was going to the cemetery where it all started. By myself at all hours of the night. Another huge mistake. One day, I got the bright idea of downloading the spirit board app on my phone. The first time I used it, I got just what I expected. Garbage. But I didn't give up. After several attempts, I made one more attempt. This time, things were different. I was sitting at my kitchen table, turned on the app, and started to ask questions. The answers were coming quickly and accurately. I thought to myself, Wow, maybe this time it really is working. I was still very skeptical and thought to myself, I am going to debunk this thing and bust it as a fake. I asked if they could see me. The answer was yes. I asked for its name. I was given Mariah. I then asked, where am I sitting? The answer was kitchen table. I asked what I was wearing. It answered correctly. I then asked it, where are you at? It answered with, next door in cellar. I thought, I have you now. So I replied with, oh, so you're in the red brick one story next door then. It responded with no. I asked, which house are you in then? The answer made my blood run cold. It replied with, gray two-story on corner abandoned. When you look out my kitchen window, there is a gray two-story on the corner of another street, and it's been abandoned for several years. It also has a cellar, not a basement. I continued to have conversations with the Spirit Board app for several months. One night, I started at one in the morning and did not stop until almost 7 a.m. It only felt like 20 minutes had went by. This Mariah could tell the things about myself that nobody would know about. It would tell me about calls I had went to years ago as a police officer and what I had seen or felt. My haunting became very horrifying for several years and I still deal with it daily and nightly. An investigation was done at my home, and they got the name Mariah as well, who they said was actually a succubus that has attached to me. I stopped using the Ouija board app a long time ago, but I am still dealing with the very real issues of using one and not closing the door when done, using it by myself, and so on. I am here to tell you, just because you use one and have no issues, doesn't mean that your time isn't coming. And when it does, I feel sorry for what you're going to deal with. 
please use with extreme caution. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Samantha Play, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. As I always say, thank you all for being the pillars that support Back to Ashes. And to the other subscribers or just listeners, thank you so, so, so much for your support. I cannot put into words how much it means to me. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.